So, we did uh, the spinal nerve, if you remember, and we talked of how this nerve, the spinal nerve, is a mixed nerve, how it is connected to the spinal cord by two roots, a dorsal or posterior root, which was sensory, a ventral or anterior root, which was motor, and then the roots uh, join to form the spinal nerve. This nerve comes out of the intervertebral foramen, which you can see here. And then in the intervertebral foramen, after it comes out, it divides into two branches, which are exactly like the nerve. Remember I said it's as if you were splicing that nerve. One of the branches goes to the back, where you can see it is supplying muscles of the back, plus it supplies skin. So it has both sensory and motor fibers. And that is known as the dorsal ramus. So this part which you are seeing here is called the dorsal ramus. And then this part here is the one which comes towards the front and this is known as the ventral ramus. So you can see that it's supplying muscles. So here it's showing you supplying intercostal muscles plus it supplies skin on the lateral aspect of the body and it comes to the front and supplies skin on the anterior aspect of the body as well. So the ventral ramus is much longer than the dorsal ramus. The rami are exactly like the nerves, so they are mixed. The roots, on the other hand, either carry afferent fibers or they carry efferent fibers. Now what happens is, as the fetus is developing, so here is the fetus developing, this is what is called the head fold, here is the pericardial cavity, here is the umbilical cord, and here is what's called the tail fold. This is a primitive fetus, and here is the eye which is going to develop. Somewhere here is where the neural tube develops. Here in this region are where the limbs develop, the upper limb and the lower limb, and then there will be one on the other side. Now, as these limbs develop and go towards, you know, they grow forward, the limbs develop, all muscles develop, develop from blocks of tissue which are known as mesoderm. So, imagine there, there are these three blocks of mesoderm. So, let's look at some muscles that you know of. So, say pectoralis major develops from the first two blocks. Um, and let's say biceps develops from three blocks. And maybe another muscle, serratus anterior, develops from here. Each of these blocks of mesoderm is actually supplied by its own nerve in the fetus. So the, here is a nerve supplying this. So since this muscle develops from these two blocks, so it, it will have two nerves supplying it. This one develops from these two, so it will have these nerves supplying it. This one develops from these two, so it will have this. So you can see what a whole heap of nerves are kind of going to go to supply muscles of the upper limb. And all of these nerves have to pass from the neck area, they pass below the clavicle and come to the muscles. So the area there is very, very narrow. Same way for the lower limb too, they have to go to the lower limb. So we will have, if all of these nerves carried their primitive nerve supply with them, we would have one muscle being supplied by three nerves and another one being supplied by four nerves. So it would be a big traffic jam in that area. So in order to kind of prevent that, what if you had a system whereby imagine these two nerves, they joined up to begin with and then you have one single nerve which now has roots coming, let's say this was C5 and C6, C5 and C6 and from this you can give branches to various muscles. So you can see that a muscle here would get from C5 and C6 but it would only have one branch supplying it. So imagine you had another one here joining this and let's say this goes down into this. So you can say this branch gets actually gets branches from all three spinal segments. So in order to kind of prevent this kind of, you know, mishmash, what we have is a network which is formed. So those primitive roots, they actually join up together and they join up forming a network and that network is known as a plexus. And this network then breaks up into branches. It has a a way to join, it breaks up into branches so that finally those branches which supply a muscle, there will be only one branch 
supplying a muscle, it'll kind of, if you trace it all the way back, you will find that it takes its roots from the same spinal segments from where it developed. So this kind of a plexus we find in relation to the upper limb, in relation to the lower limb. We find plexuses otherwhere as well. In relation to the limbs in the upper limb, the plexus is known as the brachial plexus. In relation to the lower limb, this plexus is known as the lumbar plexus. And the idea is to supply the muscles from the same spinal segments, the mesodermal segments and the spinal nerves which supplied it. But then instead of having a whole heap of nerves supplying them, you have one nerve, but if you can trace its you know, way back to the roots from where it developed, okay? So you have these plexuses which are formed. Now, since most of the muscles, the limbs also, they develop in this lateral wall. So here is where the limbs will develop. So these plexuses which are formed are formed from the ventral rami. So these ventral rami, they are the ones which join up and form the plexuses. So in the upper and lower limbs, it's the ventral rami which join to form those plexuses. So all this while, we kind of concentrated, we were talking about sensory um, integration and, you know, we talked of how sensory or afferent fibers went towards the spinal cord. Uh, remember, we looked earlier that they could actually set up a reflex where a sensory neuron went and synapsed on an interneuron and a motor neuron then from the spinal cord came out and, you know, did an action. Or sensory fibers could travel all the way up to the brain where they had to stop first at the thalamus and then they go up to the brain and where, you know, whatever sensation it is that is perceived. Now let's look at motor integration. So this was a part that I described earlier. So you have a sensory input and this could go in, it gets into the spinal cord. So it is at the lowest level and in the spinal cord it will synapse either directly on a motor neuron which begins from that ventral horn or maybe synapse on an interneuron which will synapse on a motor neuron and then it will come out through the ventral root and go and supply a muscle, right? So this is kind of a local reflex that could occur. Or, for example, you could what you could have is a sensory input goes up to the brain and then in the brain it is kind of... Um, integrated you are aware of the stimulus and then a response is generated so from the motor area of the brain a response is generated it comes down into the spinal cord where it will kind of uh, synapse on the anterior horn cells and then that will go to supply the muscles and while it is doing this while the brain centers are doing this they also send a copy of their what information they are sending they also send it to the highest level which is the cerebellum and the various ganglia which are present or the nuclear not ganglia the various nuclei which are present called basal nuclei like the caudate nucleus and all that so they send the information there if you remember, I mentioned one of these, which was the cerebellum. I told you the cerebellum was like a monitor, right? It, it sort of got information from, it got sensory information. It also got to know what the brain was deciding to do. And it decided, is the sensory information, the input that I'm getting and the output that is going out from the motor cortex, are they kind of working together? Or is the response greater or is the response less? If it is not matching what the sensory input it is, then the cerebellum corrects that error, right? Remember, it corrects motor errors. So it, it is the one which coordinates. It makes sure that everything is done in a very, very smooth manner. So this the motor cortex of the brain, when it sends impulses down, it sends information to the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. And these basal nuclei also prevent unwanted errors. And I think I mentioned this, that whenever you have diseases which involve these basal nuclei, for example, Parkinson's disease is one such disease, these people kind of have something known as tremors. That means they shake a lot or they have a mask-like face. You know, they have all of these unwanted effects because the basal nuclei are not functioning properly. So they are not able to coordinate the sensory input and the motor output. They are not able to make sure that that goes properly. 
The same with cerebellar problem. See, the cerebellar, cerebellum is getting input from the sensations which come to it. It's also getting input from what the motor cortex decides to do. It makes sure that these two match each other. And it then sort of sends the information back to the motor cortex saying, yes, you're doing fine. Or it says, no, you're not doing fine. You need to change this. And the motor cortex accordingly adapts. So that the final output from the motor cortex is such, such a way that everything is very, very smooth. Now, if the cerebellum is not functioning, what happens is people are not able to maintain balance or posture. And I also gave you that example of when, you know, you want to touch your nose or something like that, your hand shakes because, again, it's not a smooth movement that occurs because it's not able to tell the motor cortex, yes, you're doing the job properly or you're not doing the job properly. So that's the problem that occurs whenever we have cerebellar or basal nuclei, if there's any problem over there, because these are the highest centers which kind of monitor the feedback. So they get the impulses, but they also monitor what is going out. And that whatever is going out is your motor output. So let's take a look at this motor integration. The corticospinal tract is the pathway which conveys axial and limb motor control. In plain English, this is the pathway that the, that the brain control the movement of muscles. So this pathway begins in the pre-central gyrus, which is the primary motor cortex. Just to clarify, the last two pathways we discussed, the dorsocolum medial lemniscus and the spinothalamic tract, projected onto the post-central gyrus. This pathway, however, arises from the pre-central gyrus. See the handwritten tutorials on brain anatomy for more information on these two gyri. So our journey begins with two neurons. One will ultimately innervate the axial muscles and the other will innervate the limb muscles. They leave the cortex by descending through the internal capsule and into the brain stem. So I'll draw the brain stem here. Here is the thalamus, which is not involved in this pathway, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. As the pathway descends into the medulla, 75 to 90% of the fibers decussate. These are the fibers that will innervate the limbs. The axial fibers don't decussate here. This decussation is one of the biggest decussations, so it's worth looking at it further. If we take a cross section through the medulla here, we will see something like this. The fibers cross to the other side of the medulla, and we call this the decussation of the pyramids. The pyramids are the corticospinal tracts as they run through the medulla. For this reason, the corticospinal tract is sometimes called the pyramidal tract. After leaving the brainstem, the fibers run down through the two corticospinal tracts that we saw in the first video in the series. These are the anterior corticospinal tract and the lateral corticospinal tract. When they get to their target level, the fibers of the anterior corticospinal tract finally decussate through the anterior white commissure before synapsing to a neuron in the anterior horn of the gray matter. Conversely, the fibers of the lateral corticospinal tract have already decussated at the level of the pyramids. As such, when they get to the appropriate level, they just synapse onto a neuron in the anterior horn. I'm just going to stop it over here. Just to tell you that you saw how he drew some of the five, 75 to 90 percent of the fibers he said crossed because they arose from one motor cortex. Remember the body is... One cortex uh, affects the opposite side of the body, right? So if it started from the right side, it has to cross so that it can come onto the left side. Or if it started from the left side, it has to cross and come onto the right. 
So you saw how 90% cross in the medulla. So starting from the left motor cortex, they are crossing. So the, now they will influence the anterior horn cells of the right side. And from here, the final pathway will come out through the ventral root and to the muscles. Some of these fibers, remember he said the remaining fibers did not cross. So here are what they form as the anterior corticospinal. So they didn't cross, but at the local level, can you see that they cross over so that they also finally kind of stimulate the opposite side of the body. And this will go and control the, the muscle fibers on that opposite side of the body. Okay, so that was the purpose. So you can see in this motor integration, the pathway started from the motor cortex, traveled all the way through the brainstem, where most of them crossed in the medulla. Some of them didn't cross. They travel down the rest of the brainstem and into the spinal cord is what is called corticospinal. The lateral corticospinal is a crossed tract. That means this side actually originated on the opposite side. So this influences the anterior horn cells and from here the fibers go out to supply muscles. This anterior corticospinal is an uncrossed tract. That means it didn't cross here. So it crosses over on this side so that the left will now influence the right side. And all these anterior horn cells will go to supply the muscles. Okay? So let's just finish. It's worth noting that the neurons in the cortex are known as upper motor neurons. And a lesion anywhere in these fibers from the cortex all the way down to the anterior horn are known as upper motor neuron lesions. This is very important clinically, but beyond the scope of this tutorial. These neurons in the anterior horn, which are intuitively called anterior horn cells, then project to the limb muscles and to the axial muscles. Again, I'll just point out... So you can see from here is what we did all this while in a spinal nerve. They come out through the ventral root and they go to the muscles in the limbs or in the axial, depending on which area of the spinal cord we are talking about. So that was, we saw the whole sensory pathway where, you know, from touching, say somebody touched you, you can have a local sort of reaction or it can go all the way up to the brain. And then we also saw that you don't necessarily always have to have a sensory stimulus. So you can decide, okay, I'm going to pick up this thing. So you have a motor pathway coming down. Now here, let's look at something which we saw this local reflex, which is I'm describing this part where you can see at the segmental level. This is what is known as a reflex and you have an arc which is formed, a circular pathway which is formed, which is known as a reflex arc. When these reflexes involve spinal or cranial nerves and therefore they involve skeletal muscle, we call such reflexes somatic reflexes. Remember somatic means having to do with body wall or voluntary muscle. When you have reflexes which involve the autonomic pathways, which we'll see, we'll do the autonomic pathways, where you don't have any control, so that means it involves smooth or cardiac muscle or glands, then we call such reflexes autonomic reflexes, okay? So as of now, we've only done the spinal and cranial nerves, so we'll be only dealing with somatic reflexes. We'll come to autonomic reflexes when we do the autonomic pathway but remember that reflexes can involve skeletal muscle or they can involve smooth and cardiac or glands when they involve skeletal is what is called somatic reflex so there are five parts to this reflex it begins with some receptor in your skin being stimulated travels by means of an uh, uh, a neuron which carrying afferent fibers or sensory neuron who, which has its cell body in the dorsal root ganglion comes into the posterior horn, synapses with an interneuron in that, N not always, but most of the time. That's so where the whole process is integrated. Then this synapses on a motor neuron, which comes out and goes to a muscle, which is called an effector. So these are, the, or it can also go to a gland. So these are the five parts of a reflex arc, a receptor, a sensory neuron, the integration center, which is the central nervous system, a motor neuron, and an effector. So let's take a look at this. Reflex action and reflex arm. Whenever we happen to come close to an object that is capable of harming us, we immediately withdraw the part of the body that is the most vulnerable. 
This is called reflex action. When a person touches a hot cup, the sensory receptors in the hand send a stimulus via the afferent pathway which contains afferent neurons to the spinal cord. The afferent neurons enter the dorsal nerve root of the spinal cord. The stimulus is passed on to the efferent neuron which travels the efferent pathway to reach the effector organ, in this case the muscles of the arm. As a result, the hand is quickly pulled back. The brain is not involved in the reflex actions as it would take more time for the impulses to travel to and fro from the brain. The afferent neurons or receptors taking the causal stimulus to the CNS, the spinal cord, the efferent neurons or effectors, the exciter neurons and the action performed in response to the stimulus together form the reflex arc. So let's look at some somatic spinal reflexes. Some of this you've done, you should have done in the lab. So here this somatic spinal reflex, one of the ones that we commonly use is called the stretch reflex. It involves skeletal muscle. What we also see, and when you did the muscular system, if you remember, uh, when a muscle is contracting, its antagonist has to relax, isn't it? Otherwise, that muscle will not be able to contract. So, for example, if you want to lift up a cup and you're using your biceps and your brachialis, the triceps on the opposite side has to relax. So, that process whereby one set of muscles are contracting and the uh, antagonists are inhibiting, we'll see that kind of uh, reaction which occurs here. So let's take this um, a, this example. So let's say you go to the doctor's office and they actually tap on your tendon. So let's say this uh, patellar tendon. So they are tapping on the patellar tendon up here. And what they do is when they kind of tap on that patellar tendon, that kind of distorts the tendon and also distorts the muscle a little bit. Inside the muscle, you have receptors which are called muscle spindles. They carry the impulse to the central nervous system, this sensory neuron comes and synapses with a motor neuron in the anterior horn cells. So the plus stands for stimulation. So it synapses with the motor neuron. That motor neuron comes out and that motor neuron goes and stimulates the extensor muscle because here I was talking about the quad, I'm using the quadriceps. If I use this example of the biceps, then it'll come and stimulate the biceps muscle, which is a flexor muscle. At the same time, look at this picture up here. It comes through via an interneuron and inhibits another anterior horn cell but this anterior horn cell is providing innervation to the muscles on the opposite side of the joint, so the antagonist. So while it stimulates one set of muscles, it inhibits the opposite or antagonistic muscle. So if I was to use the quadriceps in this case, it would stimulate the quadriceps and inhibit the hamstrings. If I was used to use the biceps muscle, it would stimulate the biceps and inhibit the triceps. Say if you are going to flex your uh, a forearm okay this process by, whereby one set is stimulated and another set is inhibited is known as reciprocal innovation reciprocal meaning one side is stimulated but the opposite the one that does the opposite movement is inhibited if this did not happen you would not be able to perform the movement so you have to relax the other side so that it can stretch enough to allow the agonistic muscles to contract. So let's take this same example uh, and use it with the patellar reflex. So, you know, you all did this in the lab uh, and those of you taking it online would have seen this reflex up here. You've, if you've gone to a doctor's office, you've seen them using the hammer on your patellar tendon. So they tap the tendon. These muscle spindles in the muscle are stimulated. They take, these are quadricep muscle is an extensor. So inside the extensor, because that tendon is stretched, that stimulates the muscle spindles. Afferent neurons travel all the way to the uh, spinal cord where they come and stimulate the anterior horn cells which will go to supply the quadriceps muscle. But at the same time, they inhibit the, the neurons which go to supply the hamstring group of muscles. 
So thereby the quadriceps contracts but the hamstring relaxes which is why your knee, knee straightens out so you are able to do extension of the knee, right? On the other hand, if you were testing the hamstrings, then the hamstrings would be stimulated and the quadriceps would be inhibited. Follow? So, it depends. You are stimulating the agonistic muscles but inhibiting the antagonistic muscles. This patellar reflex is one example of a somatic spinal reflex. We call it spinal reflex because this is carried via spinal nerves. The nerve which supplies the quadriceps muscle is called the femoral nerve. And usually the same nerve takes the afferent and the efferent impulses. So it's the same nerve which is taking afferent and efferent impulses. We could use the same example in for the biceps. So if I was to tap the tendon of the biceps, I would flex my elbow. In that case, another spinal nerve is used which is known as the musculocutaneous nerve because that's the nerve which supplies the biceps muscle. So, in any case, it's the spinal nerve which is involved and the, that nerve carries impulses and brings out impulses from the spinal cords and it's going to skeletal muscle. So, therefore, it's called a spinal stretch reflex. There's another type of reflex which we often see which is a protective withdrawal reflex. Often you may have seen, especially in a very scary situation, imagine, you know, you're, again, you're traveling, um, you're in a dark alley or something, or somebody, even um, in a crowded uh, place, if someone kind of holds your arm, uh, your forearm in a um, kind of an antagonistic manner or in a manner where you think that person is going to hurt you, what is your normal reaction is to pull that arm away and with the other arm you try to push them away, right? So, you're flexing this arm so that you're kind of pulling that arm away and that's called the flexor response whereas your opposite limb is extending because you're trying to push them away. So, this is known as flexor and crossed extensor reflex. It's a protective reflex and see how it happens in the spinal cord. So, here is something. So, here imagine this person, somebody comes and holds this person's forearm and you get the impression that this is not a friendly move, this person is going to harm you. So, the impulses travel all the way to the spinal cord. They come here, they stimulate your flexors and they inhibit your extensors. This is that reciprocal in, uh, innovation. So, your flexors contract and you, t you know, pull your arm away. At the same time, that very same neuron by means of interneurons crosses over to the opposite side and there it goes and stimulates the extensor muscles but inhibits the flexors of that side. By stimulating the extensor muscles, this way you extend the other limb so that you kind of push them away and you're flexing on the side where your uh, forearm was touched. This same thing could happen in the lower limb as well. So imagine someone kind of kicks you in the lower limb you would, on that side, you would kind of pull away from them, but with the other one, you would stretch out and try to kick them back, right? So, this is a protective reflex, since on one side, the flexors are being used, but on the opposite side, the extensors are stimulated. That's why this is called flexor and crossed extensor reflex. This is also something which is very useful in maintaining balance. So, you know, you're kind of tripping over something, one part flexes, but the other one automatically extends. So, you imagine like you're, you, you're, you're going to fall down. So on the side, you know, you put, you stretch out your hand and kind of prevent yourself from uh, losing balance. So it helps with that. So and again, it's a very protective reflex that you see. This is also a somatic reflex because it is using skeletal muscles. Okay. So this flexor and crossed extensor reflex is a withdrawal reflex because you withdraw from one side though you're pushing from the other side. There are some reflexes. So, all of this, can you see, was what I just showed you. Those two slides were occurring at the local spinal level. There are some reflexes, however, which kind of developed uh, when we were children and they were protective in nature and they remain uh, throughout as protective reflexes. These are known as superficial reflexes. The difference in superficial reflexes and those spinal reflexes is that in superficial reflexes, it doesn't occur at the local level, at the spinal cord. It actually travels all the way up to the higher centers and then comes back. Both go to skeletal muscles, but in those somatic stretch reflex and the somatic 
flexor and crossed extensor, it was going locally to the spinal cord. In superficial reflexes, they test higher brain centers. So sometimes if there is a stroke in the brain up here, this local spinal reflex may work, but the superficial reflex is gone because it's kind of involving the higher brain centers. Let's look at some of these reflexes. One is if they, te they test, and this often they test when someone's had a stroke or they've had a brain injury, they um, scratch the sole of your foot. They go from lateral to medial like this. Normally, what should happen is it's, you know, you try, if someone does that, you try to kind of withdraw your foot and you will kind of curl up your toes, you flex your toes. That's a normal reaction that occurs. And how does, how does that occur? The touching the skin on the plantar surface of your foot takes the sensory impulses and here is where the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion, goes into the spinal cord, it synapses, travels all the way to the sensory cortex, crosses over to the motor cortex, impulses cross over and then from the motor cortex an impulse travels down, crosses, comes to the anterior horn cell and this goes to the, this will come in uh, synapse on skeletal muscles. So, which the muscles which help you to, you know, flex your toes and uh, cause dorsiflexion. So, this kind of thing is, uh, is known as the plantar reflex. The same reflex is seen in men. If you stroke the medial side of their thigh, there is a muscle which um, which travels around the test, not really the testes, but there is, uh, the, from the testes is a tube coming, which is known as the vas deferens. And that vas deferens is, uh, has blood vessels along with it. And that is covered by uh, connective tissue. So there's a muscle which kind of surrounds that, which is known as the cremastric muscle. So if someone was to touch the medial side of the skin of a man's thigh, or even kick in that area, or make the... Uh, just kind of not necessarily even touch the skin but make the gesture that they are going to kick that area, what happens is that cremastric muscle contracts and it pulls the testes out of harm's way. So the testes actually kind of goes up uh, above the scrotum. That kind of reflex is known as cremastric reflex. That also goes instead of from the sole of the skin, from the medial side of the thigh, it does the same thing, goes all the way up to the higher brain centers, comes down to the spinal cord in the lumbar region and then it will go and supply the cremastric muscles. The same thing happens with the abdominal skin. If you were to just kind of uh, scratch on the surface of the abdomen, you'll immediately see the muscles contract. That also is protective. Remember, your anterior abdominal wall does not have bone. It only has muscle. And it is uh, protecting a lot of very important internal organs. So, just touching the surface of your abdominal skin makes these muscles contract so that they're able to protect the, the various organs underneath. Again, the pathway is the same. So, you can see that it is going to the higher brain centers and you can see how these are all protective reflexes which are present. If the higher brain centers were damaged or any part over here was cut like this, these reflexes would disappear. You would not see these reflexes, okay? So, this, these kind of reflexes are called superficial reflexes. They are on the surface of the skin that we use. So, either plantar, cremastric or the abdominal skin. So, here we looked at spinal reflexes. Let's look at a cranial nerve reflex, which is also somatic because it is going to skeletal muscle. All of you at some point in your life have had this happen to you, but you have not realized what's happening. You know, let's say you're traveling on a hot, on a windy day, something goes into your eye, you know, a little bit of dust goes into your eye. What is your normal reaction? Closing of your eyes, right? So look at the pathway, how that happens. Over the surface of your eyeball, there is an area which is called the cor cornea. And uh, that cornea is actually covered by a layer called the conjunctiva. So this would be same for cornea and conjunctiva. So either something touches the surface of the cornea or it touches the area around which is the conjunctiva. Some small sort of little debris which is irritating your eye. From there, sensory pathways are taken by the fifth cranial nerve because all sensation from the face area is by the fifth cranial nerve. 
So taken by the fifth cranial nerve, it goes to the pons. If you remember from the, the fifth to the eighth cranial nerves arise from the pons. Inside the uh, pons, instead of a gray matter being present like in the spinal cord in a butterfly shape, the gray matter is concentrated in an area which is called the fifth nerve nucleus. So here the afferent fiber synapses. An interneuron connects this fifth nerve nucleus with the seventh nerve nucleus. Because this muscle, which is this muscle which is surrounding the eye? Orbicularis oculi, right? That's the muscle which you use to close your eyes. So you have an interneuron which comes and synapses on the seventh nerve nucleus. If you remember, what is a nucleus? An area where nerve cell bodies are present. This, from this seventh nerve nucleus, axons pass out. They pass out in the seventh nerve and go to supply the orbicularis oculi. So something touches your cornea or your conjunctiva. This travels all the way to the fifth nerve nucleus in the pons from where it's connected by another neuron to the seventh nerve nucleus. Seventh nerve sends out efferent fibers which come and supply the muscle and the muscle contracts. So it is still somatic because it is going to skeletal muscle. The only difference being that here two nerves are used. The afferent is via one cranial nerve. The efferent is via another cranial nerve. Unlike the spinal reflex where the same nerve sub takes the, the sensation and brings the motor fibers. Okay. So with cranial nerves, since cranial nerves are not mixed nerves, in many cases you might have one nerve taking afferent, another nerve bringing efferent, and the two nerves are connected to each other, their nuclei are connected to each other by interneurons which are present. So let's, here's another example, like a gag reflex. So you know, if somebody, sometimes you get some, or somebody puts a tongue depressor in your mouth, you have that gag reflex. So again, you touch the uh, posterior surface of your tongue so either the fifth or the ninth nerve may be involved and then your muscles of the pharynx which are supplied by the tenth cranial nerve mainly they contract and that's how you get the gag reflex so the afferent limb is the ninth and the efferent limb is the tenth so let's take a look at this corneal reflex i'm now checking for the corneal reflex testing cranial nerve five to perform this reflex, you will need a cotton applicator or a cotton ball. Take the cotton tip and pull it out to a wisp. You will approach the patient from the side and ask him to look straight ahead for me, please. Okay. And you will look for a blink response when you touch the wisp to the eye. Do you notice how he blinked? Can you get straight ahead for me, please? So you saw how that person blinked, which was a normal reaction which you had. If either of these nerves was damaged, can you understand that the reflex will not occur, right? It's not only, you're testing for both the fifth and the seventh. She mentioned only fifth, but you're really testing for both cranial nerves. So, so far we were doing the somatic nervous system and we looked at skeletal muscle, we looked at those or reflexes which involve cranial and spinal nerves. Now let's look at the autonomic nervous system and here we are going to look at a system which, which is a motor system. That means you only have efferent pathway coming out of the central nervous system and this efferent pathway goes to supply smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and it goes to supply glands. There are two divisions of this system. One is called the parasympathetic, one is called the sympathetic. For most part, these two divisions kind of act antagonistic to each other. That means one raises the heart rate, one decreases the heart rate. One causes vasoconstriction, the other not always causes vasodilation. Maybe that was different. One causes increase in digestive activity, the other one decreases digestive activity. So usually they act uh, opposite to each other, but... Otherwise, in your daily life, they act in such a harmonious manner that one part is acting and then the other part is depressed but can quickly take over. This we'll find is different from the somatic nervous system because when you looked at the somatic nervous system and we looked at the 
we looked at the spinal cord up here. So here, can you see this motor neuron which begins in the anterior horn over here? This motor neuron comes straight out through the ventral root, travels in the spinal nerve and then goes to muscle. So if, if this nerve has to go to the lower limbs, imagine it will have a very, very long route all the way to the lower limbs, right? Nerves which has to go to the neck or to the chest area are much shorter. In the case of the autonomic nervous system, what happens is the neuron is intercepted in the midway through a ganglion which is present. So it doesn't come straight out. So it will come out of the central nervous system. So let's say it comes out of the spinal cord. It doesn't go straight to cardiac or smooth muscle. What it does is it comes out, synapses, and then a second neuron is the one which takes it to the final effector organ, which could be cardiac, smooth muscle, or gland. So this part where the synapses occurring, that is has a ganglion there, because remember, synapses occur between two neurons, right? So you'll have a neuron which is before the synapse, which is called presynaptic or also known as preganglionic and you'll have a neuron which is after the synapse which is called postganglionic neuron. Somatic nervous system uses only one neuron because it, that one neuron starts in the anterior horn and travels all the way up to the end. Here we will see it starts in the spinal cord or in the brain but it synapses somewhere and then a second neuron starts. So therefore, the cell bodies of these motor neurons in the autonomic nervous system lie both in the central nervous system and outside the central nervous system in autonomic ganglia. In the somatic nervous system, the cell bodies lie only in the central nervous system. For spinal nerves, remember, they were in the anterior horn cells. For spinal nerves. For cranial nerves, they were in those motor cranial nerve nuclei like I just showed you for the seventh cranial nerve. So here, see in the seventh cranial nerve, this cranial nerve nucleus was present in the pons, which is part of the brain. So that was within the central nervous system. It comes straight out and goes, so it doesn't stop anywhere. Whereas in autonomic, we will find that we have the cell bodies lying within the CNS, but they also lie outside the CNS. The somatic nervous system, Wherever it is going and synapsing at the neuromuscular junction, it uses uh, acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. In the autonomic nervous system, we use two types of neurotransmitters. One is acetylcholine, in which case the neurons are called cholinergic. And the other one is epinephrine or norepinephrine or also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. So these neurons are known as adrenergic. The sympathetic nervous system has both, we will see, both cholinergic and adrenergic. The parasympathetic has only cholinergic. So we'll take a look at this. So here, let us compare what we just said. So here is the somatic nervous system. Its cell bodies lie within the, this is the, because autonomic is motor, Somatic has both motor and sensory. We are only comparing the motor parts since autonomic doesn't have a sensory. So there is nothing to compare. So in the motor pathway, this cell body begins in the central nervous system. So if I draw the spinal cord, the cell body begins in this anterior horn. If I draw the brain, the cell body will begin in the nuclei of the cranial nerves within the brain. It travels all the way out. No synapse, so it can be a short nerve or a long nerve as it's going to its muscle. The muscle is always skeletal. It always causes stimulation of the skeletal muscle, so it makes it contract. And at the neuromuscular junction, the neurotransmitter which is released is acetylcholine. So this is the somatic nervous system. Let's look at the autonomic nervous system. There is a ganglion interspersed in between. So we'll always have two neurons. Here is the neuron which begins in the central nervous system. So this is like somatic. So it's beginning in the central nervous system. Even the parasympathetic. Comes out of the central nervous system, usually very lightly myelinated. 
<coughs> synapses in the ganglion in the case of sympathetic when it synapses in the ganglion at that part this neuron is cholinergic so these neurons these are which are known as post ganglionic this will be called pre pre ganglionic these will be called post ganglionic so these post ganglionic neurons have receptors which respond to uh, acetylcholine these post ganglionic neurons then go to their target organs and at their target organs they liberate epinephrine or nor norepinephrine or what we call adrenaline or noradrenaline so at this synapse you have acetylcholine at its target organ we have epinephrine or norepinephrine two neurotransmitters are used these are called preganglionic or also you will find the term presynaptic because it's before the synapse these are after the synapse so these are called postsynaptic in the sympathetic nervous system this is one which is going to the organs part of the sympathetic nervous system is also a gland which is called the adrenal gland and the center of the adrenal gland called the adrenal medulla is part of the sympathetic nervous system so actually here in the adrenal medulla we don't have a post ganglionic fiber so this pre ganglionic fiber comes synapses on the adrenal medulla where it liberates acetylcholine and the cells of the adrenal medulla the cells themselves liberate epinephrine and norepinephrine so they don't have an axon really the cells themselves that means these post ganglionic neurons they act the cells act like post ganglionic neurons without an axon and those cells liberate epinephrine and norepinephrine which goes into the blood stream and then that travels and does the actions of the sympathetic nervous system let's look at the parasympathetic begins in the central nervous system lightly myelinated so this is pre ganglionic synapses in a ganglion outside the cns like this liberates acetylcholine the post ganglionic fibers begins from there post ganglionic neuron and its fiber which goes to the target organs and there in the target organs also it it liberates acetylcholine so the neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic is acetylcholine whereas the neurotransmitter in the sympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine and epinephrine and norepinephrine so let's describe the sympathetic nervous system this is a system which is a system which keeps you alert so that's why it's called the flight fight system so anything or and you know sometimes you also add fright with it so anything which kind of makes you want to fight so you know you're running after somebody with a big stick anything which kind of makes you scared so your hair stands up right and then another one where you're kind of running away from someone right so three so all three things which put you on high alert So here you can see the neurotransmitter is epinephrine or norepinephrine as the target organ but in the ganglia we have acetylcholine which is secreted so it's acetylcholine at the ganglia Every organ that has a blood supply has to have a sympathetic supply because sympathetic nerve fibers supply blood vessels Any organ which doesn't have a blood supply there are very few organs in the body the cornea is one example the lens of the eye is another example your epithelium is one example a vascular so all of these areas which don't have a blood supply they lack a, uh, sympathetic fibers but otherwise every other part of the body which has a blood supply has sympathetic supply now when we did the somatic nervous system you saw that it was you know you had cranial nerves which were sensory motor or mixed we saw spinal nerves which were all spinal nerves or mixed so spinal nerves supplied skin so sk uh, sensations from all over the skin or from below the neck went to the spinal cord through all the spinal nerves and all spinal nerves carried motor fibers to the various muscles which are present from the neck downwards axial or appendicular 
In the case of the head area, the sensations passed mainly through the fifth, but other sensations, special sensa sensations like olfaction and um, hearing and taste and all that went through the other cranial nerves. And motor fibers passed out through some cranial nerves to supply the muscles of the uh, face, right? So again, the somatic nervous system used all cranial nerves, all spinal nerves to carry out its job of supplying the skin and muscles of your body wall. The autonomic nervous system, on the other hand, because you do not have cardiac and smooth muscle all over the body, right? You have smooth muscle, okay, you have some smooth muscle in your skin. What is that smooth muscle in the skin? Pardon? Very good, erector pylorum. So, only in the skin you have erector pylorum. Otherwise, smooth muscle is present within the organs in your cavities. Cardiac muscle only present in the heart. Glands are present not all over the body, only in some areas. Like you have the lacrimal gland in your face, you have the salivary glands in your face, and then the glands are all in your respiratory and gastrointestinal tract. So with the result, the parasympathetic nervous system does not have to use the entire central nervous system or the entire peripheral nervous system to reach its target. Okay? And an example I like to give is that imagine, for example, let's say you have three cell phone companies and um, let's use Verizon and we use AT&T and another tiny one what is it there's a cricket or something like that right the, let's say that okay so Verizon kind of um, considers itself the one that reaches everybody or the best carrier so let's say here is the brain and the spinal cord and here are all the cranial and the spinal nerves so, Verizon, what it does is like your somatic nervous system. It kind of uses all of this. It has its headquarters all over here and hence uses all these cranial nerves and spinal nerves to have a to and fro communication. Okay, with the skin and the muscles. So, that's the somatic nervous system. Uses the entire anatomical central nervous system and all of the peripheral nervous system to carry out its job. Let's look at the autonomic and we divide the autonomic into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So let's say sympathetic was something like AT&T. What it does is that it takes origin from or has its headquarters, let's say only in this part, only in the spinal cord. So it's only present here. And what it does is, it actually uses all the spinal nerves. The ones which are above, what it does, it somehow travels up and goes out. The ones which are below, it travels down and goes out. So that's how it does its job. Let's look at parasympathetic. It only uses this part. So it's like that cricket service, which only uses, it has its headquarters up here and maybe a little bit down here. So, it uses some cranial nerves to do its job and a few spinal nerves to do its job. So, can you see the difference between them? Okay. So, that's what I mean. That this, the headquarters of the sympathetic nervous system is we'll see in the thoracic 1 to lumbar 2 segments of the spinal cord. How many thoracic segments are there? 12. There are 12 thoracic nerves, so 12 thoracic segments. So, that means... In 14 segments of the spinal cord, right? In 14 segments of the spinal cord, that's where it starts. And then it will go to all the spinal nerves and that's how it is going to, because all of your skin is has blood vessels. Remember, everything which has blood vessels is supplied by sympathetic. So it starts from here. So that's why it's called thoracolumbar outflow. It flows out from there. And then it's connected to the spinal nerves and then... These spine, it has ganglia which are connected to the spinal nerves and there are ganglia which are present in front of the aorta as well. So the ganglia which are connected to the spinal nerves are known as sympathetic trunk or chain because the ganglia are connected in this fashion. They kind of form a little chain like this. These are also known as paravertebral ganglia. Just in case you read this somewhere, you'll wonder what it means. It's called paravertebral because it's by the side of the vertebra. 
we have some ganglia which are present in front of the aorta. So those ganglia are called prevertebral. The neurons, the preganglionic neurons have to have one synapse because when we describe the autonomic nervous system, see we said there has to be one synapse. So we will see that the preganglionic neurons, they either synapse in the sympathetic trunk or they come in synapse in this prevertebral ganglion. When they do that, they go to supply smooth muscle of blood vessels and various organs. They also go and supply the erector pylorum muscle. They also go to supply cardiac muscle. And the sympathetic system, the only gland it supplies are sweat and actually you can add sebaceous glands as well up here. Sweat and sebaceous. Sebaceous are really through erector pylorum because it squeezes them. But some myoepithelial fibers of sebaceous glands may have a sympathetic um, supply. So it supplies smooth muscle of blood vessels, smooth muscles of various organs and this erector pylorum in the skin. That's why it is present with all the spinal nerves. It supplies cardiac muscle and it supplies sweat glands all over the body. The idea is to put the body on high alert. That's why what it does, it will cause your blood vessels to constrict in most of the parts, except in areas where it needs blood supply like the brain and the heart, the blood vessels will dilate. It will increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure, make your bronchi dilate. It will cause your hair to stand up. So you've all noticed when you feel a little scared, you know, your hair kind of stands up. And that's why I drew it that way. You start sweating when you're scared. And that's because the sympathetic system is activated. So let's take a look at how this sympathetic reaches its path. So here, as I said, it arises from the T1 to L2 segments of the spinal cord. So let's say here they haven't drawn the entire spinal cord. So imagine this is the spinal cord. And let's say L2 segment is here. So this is where the sympathetic system arises. So that's why it's called thoracolumbar outflow. These are the spinal nerves which are present. So these preganglionic fibers emerge with that ventral root of the spinal nerve. And attached to the ventral root, you have these ganglia. So what, so imagine here's the spinal cord. Here's the ventral root. Here's the dorsal root, dorsal root ganglion. Here's the, sp here's the spinal nerve. And we saw divides into a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus, right? So attached to this ventral ramus actually is a ganglion like this. And these ganglia get connected to one. All the ventral rema have these ganglia. So that's what they are showing over here. So these fibers come out through the ventral root, come into this ventral ramus and synapse there. From here, they travel back in the ventral ramus and dorsal ramus and will go to supply the blood vessels, the erector pylorum muscle, the sweat glands and all that. In the thoracic area, they will go, they'll pass right out of the ganglia and go to supply cardiac muscle. They'll go to supply the uh, smooth muscle in the, in the lung, in the bronchi. In order to get to the blood vessels and all, up all in the face, because we, we don't see any spinal nerves in the head area. So what they do is they travel, they kind of form a network around blood vessels and that's how they t reach the skin of the face so that's how they supply the face area so these ganglia are what is known as the sympathetic trunk or sympathetic chain and also called paravertebral ganglia but here I also said that there are some ganglia which are present in front of the aorta so imagine up here here is the aorta which, which is lying within your abdominal cavity and here is the stomach and the intestines and all that. The sympathetic nervous system has to reach these, these organs as well. Surrounding or sitting in front of the aorta are various ganglia present like this. Since they lie in front of the vertebra, these ganglia are known as prevertebral. Some sympathetic fibers, what they do, they pass right out. They come out through the ventral root. They pass out through the sympathetic chain. They don't synapse there. 
but they come in synapse here. It's like imagine paying toll. So let's say you were going from here to Bradenton. Instead of paying toll right here at Seminole, you what you do is you drive all the way and then you pay toll at the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, which is closer to Bradenton than this part, right? So since these ganglia are closer to the organs, they synapse here in these ganglia and then the postganglionic fibers go to the various, here are postganglionic fibers going to various organs. So for the abdominal organs and the pelvic organs, the synapse occurs in the prevertebral ganglia. For almost everywhere else, the synapse occurs in the sympathetic chain. So for most part, you can see the synapse is only one. Most of the body, the synapse occurs in, the, in these paravertebral ganglia, what are called sympathetic trunk ganglia. For abdominal and pelvic organs, just a few over there, it occurs here in this prevertebral ganglia. As a general rule, therefore, we can say that these preganglionic, these fibers are called preganglionic. These preganglionic fibers are shorter and postganglionic fibers are longer. Can you see that? As a general rule. The preganglionic fibers are shorter because these ganglia are close to the spinal cord and the postganglionic fibers are longer. This is of course different where we have the prevertebral ganglia. There it was changed. Let's see what some of the things the sympathetic nervous system does. And if you think of what happens when you are on alert, you should be able to work these actions out. When you are frightened or you want to take flight, you want your heart to pump faster so that it can push more blood out, right? So your heart rate increases. When more blood is pushed out, that raises your blood pressure. You also want to be breathing better so your respiratory rate grows up, goes up. You also want to dilate your bronchi so that, you know, more air goes in and you can breathe better so you have dilation of the bronchi. At this time, do you want your skin to be well supplied with blood and your digestive tract when you are scared? Do you want that to get good blood supply? Which areas are the ones which need good blood supply? Your brain so that you can think better. Your heart, coronary blood vessels so that they, the heart can function better. And your skeletal muscles so that you can run faster. So everywhere in the body you're, you have vasoconstriction, meaning there is constriction or the blood vessels get narrower. But the heart, skeletal muscle and, cor and the uh, blood vessels of the brain, there is vasodilation. That's the reason why, you know, when you uh, may have noticed when you come for an exam, sometimes you begin to feel a little cold. Not only does your hair rise up, you feel a little cold because the, the blood supply to your skin is constricted. So that makes you feel cold. You'll find this more in winter, not so much in summer because you're already hot. But in winter, when you're feeling cold, if you have an exam, some people who are sympathetic activity, you get a little bit more anxious. They find that they begin to feel a little cold and that's because of vasoconstriction of the cutaneous blood vessels. When you're trying to run away from something, you want your pupils to dilate. That's why we say pupils dilate with fear. So that if your pupils dilate, more light can go in, you can see better. So that's the reason why your pupils dilate. At this time, you do not want your gastrointestinal system to be acting and removing all the blood, blood supply and, you know, digesting all the food and contracting. What you want to do is gastrointestinal activity as far as possible should stop. You shouldn't be wanting to find a, a, some place to pee at this time. So that's why your gastrointestinal tract, the sphincters contract. Sphincters are areas like valves. So that when they are contracted, food and feces all remain in one place. It doesn't pass out. Um, same way with the urinary tract. You don't pee at that time. You, at least you don't have the urge to pee at that time so that, you know, you're busy doing other things. You're trying to run away from something that's scaring you. So the gastrointestinal tract, the urinary tract, all of these tracts kind of now are at rest. They are not acting at this time. They act more when, you know, you're at, you, when you don't, you're not scared. This kind of sympathetic activity is also responsible for short-term stress. So, you know, you might find that during 
um, times of exam, uh, you know, when there's an exam, or if you have an accident, you know, something like that happens, or your house burns, or if I t told you right now that, oh, there's a fire in this room, all of you will run out, uh, your heart rate and all of this will go up, but this will stay for a very short time. Once that, that stressful stimulus is gone, you know, your body comes back to normal. So this is important to get you immediately prepared. So it is important for short-term stress control. In long-term stress control in ANP2, you'll see that we have hormones from the adrenal cortex called the steroid hormones, which help us do that. Compare this to the parasympathetic system. This is a system which acts when you are absolutely relaxed, at rest. So then your digestive activity can occur, your urine, you can, you know, go and um, um, empty your bladder, you can empty the rectum. So all this occurs during at rest. The neurotransmitter here is acetylcholine, both at the preganglionic and at the target site. So between pre and post ganglionic at that ganglion and at the target site. Now, just as we saw that the sympathetic nervous system was what we call thoracolumbar outflow, the sympathetic took origin from here and traveled with all the spinal nerves. The parasympathetic system is what is called a craniosacral outflow. So what it does is it arises in the brain in association with four cranial nerves. Those four cranial nerves are the third, seventh, ninth and tenth. So it comes out with these four cranial nerves. So third, no, sorry, not fourth, third, seventh, ninth, and tenth. Did I say fourth? By mistake. Third, seventh, ninth, and tenth. And it also arises in the spinal cord with just three spinal nerves, the sacral two, three, and four. So it travels with these cranial nerves and these three spinal nerves. And obviously, in between will be ganglia present so that it will synapse and then a postganglionic fiber will start. So that's why this is called craniosacral outflow. In other words, it flows out or it emerges from the cranium and the sacral region. The sympathetic nervous system had two sets of ganglia, one which were very close to the spinal cord, which we call the sympathetic trunk or also called paravertebral and one which were present in front of the aorta, which we call prevertebral. The parasympathetic has ganglia which are connected to the cranial nerves. So if this is, say, the third cranial nerve or the seventh cranial nerve, it will have a ganglion hanging from it. Or you might also have ganglia which are not attached to a nerve, but the ganglia are actually in the walls of the organ themselves. So if imagine that this is the urinary bladder. So inside the wall of the organ is a ganglion. So a parasympathetic fiber comes, a preganglionic will synapse on this ganglion and then the postganglionic will supply the muscle. So in the parasympathetic, the preganglionic are very, very long and the postganglionic are usually short. So this is a general rule. It also supplies pretty much the same things as the sympathetic system. It supplies smooth muscles of organs, supplies cardiac muscle and most of the glands in your body are supplied by the parasympathetic other than the sweat glands. So that means it supplies the lacrimal gland, it's responsible for tearing up lacrimation. Supplies the salivary gland, so it is responsible for salivation. Think of it, you cry, yeah I know you, people cry when they are scared but otherwise generally it's a more emotional feeling. You cry when you're kind of not, when you're scared, you're more in, um, more concerned with running away from whatever is disturbing you. Uh, salivation occurs, you know, when again, when you're at rest. It supplies glands in the respiratory and digestive tract. All this glandular activity occurs again when you're at rest. So all glands other than sweat and sebaceous glands are supplies, supplied by the parasympathetic nervous system. The idea of this system is to put this body in a nice and restful state so that, you know, you're kind of doing everything very, very, um, in a very, very peaceful manner and your body is not on high alert.
So now here, let's look at the actions of the parasympathetic. They were um, enumerated in the previous slide, so up here. So here are um, where it originates from, and uh, sorry, the actions weren't enumerated. Um, I told you where it originates from, uh, where the ganglia are present, and overall, uh, it puts the body in a restful state. So let's look at some of what was described. So this originates in the brain and in the sacral part of the spinal cord. So that's why the parasympathetic system is called the craniosacral outflow. That means it flows out from the cranium, so craniosacral. And when it, so the headquarters are in the brain and in the spinal cord. And in the brain, the way it travels out is with four cranial nerves and these four cranial nerves are up here, the third, seventh, ninth and tenth. And then it goes in the spinal cord, it travels out of the spinal cord with the sacral two, three and four spinal nerves. A lot of its actions are, as we said, to put the body at rest. It also causes glandular secretion, which is what happens when the body is at rest. So let's see how it does these. So up here in the head area where it travels with these four cranial nerves, it goes to the various glands which are present. Other than sweat glands and sebaceous, which were supplied by sympathetic, all the other glands in the body are supplied by parasympathetic. So let's look at the glands which are present up here in the head and neck area. So you have the lacrimal gland, you have the salivary glands, you also have glands which I've not mentioned but you'll have glands in the nasal mucosa as well. So you have these glands present in the nasal mucosa as well. Um, so the parasympathetic system here, it causes salivation and salivation it does so by going to the salivary glands with along with the seventh and the ninth cranial nerves. So the seventh and the ninth cranial nerves have a parasympathetic component. It also causes lacrimation and that lacrimation travels, the fibers to the lacrimal gland travel with the seventh cranial nerve. So you can see that the seventh does both salivation and lacrimation. Then we later see how in the head area how it affects the eye. So that's how it travels with the third. It also causes increased in, increase in gastrointestinal motility as well as secretions. So not only motility but gastrointestinal secretions. So even in fact, even in the respiratory tract, so you may even add the respiratory tract causes secretion of mucus there. So this is does it does by means of traveling with the 10th cranial nerve. So here's the 10th cranial nerve. So it goes to the bronchi and causes mucus production there, it goes to the GI tract, causes secretion from the various glands over there. Then the parasympathetic system had an action on smooth muscle as well as cardiac muscle. So in smooth muscle, what it does is it causes contraction of the bladder so that one can pass urine. And so here, this it will do through the sacral segments of the spinal cord because the bladder is present in the pelvic area. It also goes to cardiac muscle and so it decreases the heart rate. In fact, it is because of our parasympathetic nervous system that at rest our normal heart rate is, we always say it's like 72 beats per minute, uh, but you could have anything lower than that and that's not abnormal. In fact, athletes have a much lower heart rate. Um, some athletes have a heart rate which at rest is about 40 beats per minute. But that's, uh, they then have a very active parasympathetic system. The reason being that when they do exercise, then from 40 it can go up to maybe 80 or something like that or 85. And, you know, it can keep up with the requirements of the body. Imagine if they started with 72 beats per minute and if the, these are trained athletes, if they exercise, their heart rate would have to go up to way beyond 120 or something, in which case the heart would beat so rapidly that it would really become ineffective, okay? So you can see that how it kind of keeps your heart rate down. So during rest, our parasympathetic system is active and what it does is it decreases your heart rate. It also decreases your respiratory rate and it goes to this cardiac muscle in the heart and to the smooth muscle in the 
uh, respiratory system by means of the 10th cranial nerve because this 10th cranial nerve is known as the vagabond nerve. It arises here in the brain, uh, in the brain stem to be specific. It travels all the way down the thorax, down into the abdomen. So you can see that as it's passing along this long route, it supplies a lot of structures along the way. It supplies a lot of structures in the thoracic region, a lot of structures in the abdominal region. So that's why it's uh, for the heart, for the respiratory tract, it's the 10th, as also the GI tract, it's the 10th cranial nerve. Uh, it causes constriction of the bronchi. So while it decreases the respiratory rate, at rest you don't need your bronchi to be dilated because you don't need to respire more frequently. So your bronchi can be slightly constricted. So that's what it does to the bronchi, causes constriction. And then if you remember, one of the actions of the parasympathetic nervous system was to cause pupillary constriction. At rest, you don't need too much light going into your eye and damaging your pupils. So it does this pupillary constriction through the third cranial nerve and it does this because it supplies a smooth muscle which is present in the iris. That smooth muscle is known as sphincter pupillae. Sphincter pupillae. So here is where it does this and the eye is in the head area so it travels through the third cranial nerve to go to the sphincter pupillae. It also helps with something known as accommodation. What accommodation is, is that if you look at a distant object and then you look at something close by, your lens, there's a lens in the eye, that lens becomes more convex and allows greater refraction of the light rays so that you can kind of look at that object close to your eyes much better. So this accommodating of the lens, whereby from a almost flattish um, you know, uh, look, flattish shape, it kind of becomes more convex, biconvex. So that process is done by another smooth muscle, which is known as the ciliaris muscle, which we'll see when we do the eye. So that ciliaris also is supplied by the third cranial nerve with the, the parasympathetic component of the third cranial nerve. So it helps with this. Pupillary constriction and accommodation is through the third cranial nerve. So that's how it performs all its actions using these four cranial nerves and these spinal nerves, these three spinal nerves, sacral 2, 3 and 4. So let's answer a few questions. So let's say we have someone who is reacting in this manner. Which part of the nervous system is responsible for their present state? Sympathetic nervous system, remember sympathetic causes you to breathe more rapidly so that you can get more air into your lungs, there will be more gas exchange, you want your pupils to be dilated because uh, you want more light to get into your eye, it supplies the sweat glands, so you sweat profusely, your pounding heart rate means your heart rate has gone up, so that's what the sympathetic system does, so it's the sympathetic system. So you're in class right now and I hope you've all had your lunch and come and you're digesting your meal. So which system is more active? Parasympathetic, yes, the opposite. It's an at-rest system. So this is the parasympathetic system. So let's look at a little bit about these autonomic receptors. So remember there were two um, neurotransmitters that we used. One was acetylcholine and one was epinephrine and norepinephrine. So at all the ganglia which are present, 
so coming from the brain and the spinal cord irrespective of whether it was parasympathetic and let's say i use red for parasympathetic which comes from the cranial region and the sacral region and i use um green for sympathetic so irrespective of which part it comes from they all have to synapse if you remember they all synapsed in a ganglia the ganglia could be close by or far away or in the case of the parasympathetic nervous system the ganglia are either close or they are within the walls of the organ so let's say there's an organ up here within the walls here this will synapse synapse and a postganglionic fiber will start so here a postganglionic fiber will start the same thing will happen with the sympathetic nervous system right so at these synapses in all synapses be it sympathetic or parasympathetic at this part up here we have the uh, neurotransmitter which is used is acetylcholine so therefore these postganglionic receptors these these postganglionic neurons sorry these postganglionic neurons they have receptors which will react to acetylcholine have you followed right so because there'll be one neuron which starts here and then this is the postganglionic neuron so on its surface it will have receptors which will react to acetylcholine because that is what is liberated here now these acetylcholine receptors are are named there are two types of receptors and these were named based on drugs which they gave and they interacted with these drugs so these are known as nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors nicotinic receptors are present on all the postganglionic neurons be it sympathetic or parasympathetic these are nicotinic receptors which are present on all postganglionic neurons they are also present at the neuromuscular junction muscarinic receptors are present because acetylcholine acetylcholine is liberated by the parasympathetic system at this synapse and also at the target organ so also at the target organ is where acetylcholine is liberated at the target organ this is liberated by the parasympathetic system so muscarinic receptors are present on the target organs which react to the parasympathetic nervous system so muscarinic receptors are present on the target organs which react to the parasympathetic nervous system nicotinic receptors are present in the postganglionic neurons of the entire autonomic nervous system so that means at these synapses and also the neuromuscular junction the sympathetic nervous system secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine at its target site so therefore these receptors because epinephrine and norepinephrine are also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline so these are also known as adrenergic receptors and there are two types alpha and beta adrenergic receptors i don't need for you to remember where you have alpha and where you have beta and these also actually divided into alpha 1 and alpha 2 and all that but the adrenergic receptors are present at the target sites of the sympathetic nervous system at the target sites of sympathetic nervous system so for example the sympathetic nervous system causes the pupil to dilate so dilator pupilli that muscle is a target site so that will have adrenergic receptors okay so we had done somatic reflexes you remember we talked of somatic reflexes one was we called uh, one was a somatic stretch reflex which had to do with the spinal nerves so it was somatic stretch to do with the spinal nerves i gave you an example like the patellar reflex which we did right you stretch that then we also had somatic crossed uh, flexor and crossed extensor reflex which was protective and again using those spinal nerves and then we had the cranial somatic cranial nerve reflexes such as you touch your uh, cornea or your conjunctiva and your pupil uh, i mean sorry your um, you blink your eyes right where skeletal muscle contraction occurs or even the gag reflex like you touch the back of your throat and your um, 
uh, pharyngeal muscles constrict and you kind of have that gag, gagging feeling. So that gag reflex. So that was using cranial nerves. Now let's look at reflexes which are autonomic in nature. So in other words, they involve uh, smooth or cardiac muscle or glands and they are involving either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. So here are some examples. One is what is called celiospinal reflex. This is either you pinch or you stroke the side of the neck, you stroke the skin over there and you do this in a very surreptitious manner. That means like you come upon a person uh, without them knowing. So, you know, like slowly if you come across a person and you kind of just gently stroke their neck or pinch their neck, um, it's fear. The idea is, you know, someone comes behind you and does something to your neck even if they touch your neck like that, because you, you think they're going to attack you, so what happens, the sympathetic nervous system kicks into action and your pupils dilate in response to that. If a person is conscious and you do that, you may not see this happen because, you know, obviously the sympathetic system won't kick in. So this is called pupillary, uh, I mean, this is called celiospinal reflex. Another reflex involving the sympathetic nervous system is that you go into a dark room. What happens? Your pupils dilate. Because you want more light to get in so that if there is anything that you need to deal with, you can see better in that darkness. So pupillary dilation in response to darkness is another example of a sympathetic reflex. Another reflex was uh, one of those uh, questions that I asked you. Um, you know, you are scared or frightened uh, or maybe even you don't need to be scared or frightened, but let's say give, since I began with that, you're scared or frightened, what happens? Your heart rate goes up, so fear causing your heart rate to go up is a sympathetic reflex. Fear causing you to sweat a lot is a sympathetic reflex. Fear causing you, your respiratory rate to go up is a sympathetic reflex. And the reflex, can you understand, it has to be a stimulus, which is fear. That stimulus goes to the, so fear is the stimulus in, in all these examples that I gave you. So that's sensory that goes to the central nervous system where it's integrated. And then from here, by means of the sympathetic nervous system, which travels with the spinal nerves, you, which they go to the sweat glands or maybe they go to cardiac muscle and increase your heart rate or they go to smooth muscle and um, cause, you know, the respiratory rate to go up and your bronchi to dilate. Okay, so can you see you have to have a stimulus and then a reaction. Or even when we did introduction lecture, if you remember on a hot day we sweat. So that is because that has nothing to do with fear or anything. So heat is a stimulus that is perceived by the hypothalamus which is connect, which acts like the body thermostat and that hypothalamus is connected to the sympathetic nervous system. And that makes you sweat. So heat causing sweating is again an example of a sympathetic response. Okay, so you can see there are so many examples of sympathetic response. Parasympathetic is the opposite. So here we had pupillary dilation in response to darkness in light. So if you go out into, the, into bright light or someone shines a flashlight into your eye, your pupils will constrict because you don't want your eye, your retina to be damaged. So this pupillary constriction in response to light is called the pupillary light reflex. This is parasympathetic because the parasympathetic nervous system by means of the third cranial nerve supplies the constrictor pupillae. Another example could be uh, something like in some people it happens in some people like they go into a panic attack and they stop breathing or the respir respiratory rate comes down sometimes their heart rate may also dip down um, uh, so, you know sometimes people have wax in their ears and if you syringe the wax in order to take the wax the uh, person um, the doctor puts in uh, you know a little water into the ear by means of a syringe that's known as syringing the ear and what it does is the person's heart rate may suddenly collapse. They might, it might come down drastically. The reason for that is that the posterior surface of the ear is supplied by the vagus nerve. And remember the vagus carried parasympathetic fibers. So when you syringe the ear, the vagus nerve gets stimulated. It goes and stimulates the heart because the vagus has, carries um, uh, a nerve supply to the heart. And what it does to the heart, it slows it down. 
So this is kind of like a side effect which happens when you have to be very careful when you syringe the ear. You have to syringe, you have to direct your syringe in a particular direction so that you don't uh, uh, stimulate the vagus nerve. Uh, another example is sometimes you might, ca this is called vasovagal attack, you may have heard of that. Uh, you catheterize a patient and the patient's heart rate comes down. I mean, they had nothing to do, your catheter is in the bladder, which is far away from the heart, but the reason is because it has stimulated the parasympathetic nervous system and caused a dip in heart rate. Yeah. Last night, I got a hip over here, broke off in my ear, and I was going to Yes, either you can, you don't, uh, you get dizzy, you might feel nauseous, you might feel like vomiting, uh, because the pa the vagus, the parasympathetic, supplies the gastrointestinal tract, making you, you know, feel nauseous and vomiting. Exactly. See, so it happened. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. And uh, the dizziness is because it causes your heart rate to drop, so you know, your, not enough blood is going to your brain. Exactly. So yeah, it happens. So you have to be a little careful when you do these things. So that's another example of a parasympathetic reflex. Uh, glandular secretion. So, you know, imagine uh, you put something on your tongue and um, immediately you begin to salivate. So stimulus is putting something on your tongue, you begin to salivate. Or uh, food enters your gastrointestinal tract, it enters the stomach and the stomach begins to secrete gastric juice. So the stimulus is the food in the stomach and gastric juice is the secretion. Or uh, let's say uh, something like this, like a little um, dirt or something gets, debris gets, foreign body gets into your eyes and your eyes tear up, right? And you begin to produce tears so that the purpose is the tears will wash away whatever that offending object is. So this is called the lacrimation reflex. So let's take a look at how this happens. So the surface of the eyeball is supplied by the fifth cranial nerve. So this is different from the corneal reflex. Do you remember the corneal reflex was you had something in your eye and you blinked. Uh, that was through the same two nerves, but then the seventh went and supplied the skeletal muscle, which was orbicularis oculi. So that was a somatic cranial reflex. Here, look at this. So if something gets into your eye, but you begin to tear up. You may blink also at the same time. So you you have two reflexes going on. One is the somatic cranial reflex and one is the lacrimation which is a parasympathetic or autonomic reflex. So something gets into your eye, afferent fibers by fifth nerve go to the fifth nerve nucleus. From the fifth nerve nucleus they go to the seventh nerve nucleus but the seventh has an extra part attached to it which is called the parasympathetic component. So all those four cranial nerves which have a parasympathetic part have little nuclei called the parasympathetic nuclei of the, so there's a parasympathetic nuclei for third, seventh, ninth, and tenth. From this parasympathetic component, fibers travel out in the seventh cranial nerve, but these go to the lacrimal gland, causing it to secrete and flu uh, tears fill your eye and they wash out that secretion. Had it been just the corneal reflex or conjunctival reflex, this part would be the same. From this fifth nerve, it would go to this main seventh nerve nucleus, and from here, it would go to the skeletal muscle, making you blink. So that is the corneal somatic reflex. Remember, somatic means going to skeletal muscle. And we, so therefore, we would call it cranial reflex because it's via a cranial nerve. Here, we call it autonomic because it's causing a gland to secrete. Okay? And we call it parasympathetic because it's the parasympathetic component which is causing this gland to secrete. So let's look at this pupillary light reflex. <clears throat> The next test we're going to do is actually look at the pupillary light reflex. The afferent limb for this is going, or the sensory limb is going to be the optic nerve, and the efferent limb, the motor limb, is going to be the ocular motor. And so what we want you to do is just take a look right there, and I want you to, again, just keep looking over there. We're going to look at the direct, as well as the consensual, over uh, here to the direct and consensual, both coming out equally. Now we're going to do the swinging flashlight test. We're going to go from one eye to the other eye, back and forth. When people stay down, there's no evidence for a deafferented people or a sensory defect. So that's good. 
So here you saw how her pupils constricted was very, very obvious. So you can see it's a reflex, which means that it has to have an afferent and an efferent limb. The efferent is by means of the third cranial nerve, the parasympathetic component. The afferent is second cranial nerve because, remember, that's the one which takes vision, right? So uh, second and the third cranial nerves are involved. So let's answer a few questions based on all that we've done so far. So tapping the patellar tendon would be what kind of a reflex? This would be a somatic stretch reflex. Remember, tapping the tendon distorts that tendon. The patellar tendon belongs to which muscle? Quadriceps femoris, which is a skeletal muscle. So it would be a somatic stretch reflex. Autonomic is only cardiac, smooth or gland. So this is not having anything to do with an autonomic part of the body. And it's not cranial nerve because quadriceps is present in your thigh, which is supplied by spinal nerves. Autonomic reflex, remember I said glandular secretion, smooth muscle or cardiac muscle is all autonomic. So this is salivation which is a function of the parasympathetic part. So this is an autonomic reflex. A somatic cranial nerve, somatic means it has to go to skeletal muscle. So for example your gag reflex or your blinking of your eye using orbicularis oculi or uh, when something touches your cornea or conjunctiva, that is a somatic cranial nerve reflex. <laughs> 